Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> and praise God for what I heard from Bobby. I heard of a bunch of things that I want to take home with me. Um, it, there are several points that he made that I just, I feel um, I can reinforce in my own way. Uh, but he spoke about the devil's schemes. Um, he spoke about what of what's on my list is on God's list. He spoke of um, not having rules, but having pure motives. There are a few of the things that I um, wanted to share. So, um, and specifically what I want to talk about is how does uh, the devil deceive us? We're warned against the deception of the enemy. How does he deceive us? How are wholehearted disciples deceived? Um, I was... I was blessed to hear what, what Bobby shared, and I want to build on that. Um, there's a story in, in Joshua, which is, is kind of interesting. I was blessed to consider this this week. Um, basically, what we see is Joshua is one of the amazing campaigns of battle and victory in all of the Bible. And Joshua, one way to think about it, he faced kind of two different kinds of enemies, or three. If there was sin in the camp, <laughs> then that was the biggest enemy, and they definitely lost whenever there was sin in the camp. So that's one thing. If there's sin in our life, then that's we can't defeat any other enemy. But then, when it when it when they looked outside of the camp, if there was no sin in the camp, they faced two different kinds of enemies. One was enemies that they <clears throat> saw who are you know bearing swords and shields and fighting them. But then there's another kind of enemy in Joshua chapter nine which is the Gibeonites. And the Gibeonites are the only people that I, that I at least I can think of right now, who they didn't come against the army of Israel with swords. They came in really ragged clothes and moldy bread, and they came in deception. And Joshua and the Israelites, they defeated all of the armies that they fought with swords. But the Gibeonites were basically the only people who remained in the land Against God's will, God's will was not for them to remain in the land, but they remained in the land because they deceived them and they got Israel to make a covenant with them. And I see this as a really um, helpful story for me to consider too, because in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, as Jesus talked about the end times and the last days, one of the big things that he warned against was deception, that we will be deceived. And... Um, you know, I appreciate it. I remember Bobby saying a few weeks ago, if a soldier's fighting on the battlefield, he doesn't want to be blindfolded. He wants to know who he's fighting. And it's one thing if we're fighting people that have swords, it's very clear. But it's another thing when the devil comes to us as an angel of light and deceives us. And, um, and so I've been thinking a lot about what are, what are some deceptions? And there are two things that have really come to my mind that I want to share. Two deceptions that Satan um, uses to trick the wholehearted. And then um, I wanted to share two things that, I've, that have come to my heart as I've been, sought to be delivered from these deceptions. The first deception is to do as much good as I possibly can. I think Satan deceives us. It's kind of the Martha mentality. It's I want to do as much good as I can. Everything on my list is equal weighted priority. Anytime I see someone in need, I help them. It feels right to, to think that the gospel is about doing good. It feels like that accords with our common sense. But, if, but we know from um, some things we've heard about Jesus' life, he didn't do all the good that he could do. He did everything he saw his father doing. And he, to say differently, he only did the good which he saw his father doing. And, and he only said the good that he heard his father speaking. And there was much good. When Jesus left, just a, a simple illustration, when Jesus left the earth, was every person who was sick healed? No. Had everyone who had not heard the gospel heard the gospel by the time he left? No. Had everyone who uh, was poor become rich? No. Jesus left with, if, if, we, if we judge kind of the, the, all the good that could be done in the world, and that as, um, then, then he left lots of unfinished business, so to speak. But he left and he said, I've accomplished the work that God gave me to do, which means he did everything God wanted him to do, and he left and the world, world was still full of problems, in a sense. And so, we, we, and there's a sense in which I know as Christians, we, I, I, I will say myself, can be deceived into thinking, man, there's so much that needs to be done. What can I do? And yet, I think it's a deception. I think Satan wins if he gets us to focus on 
countless number of things and to consider all the good that can be done in the world as good which we are supposed to do rather than listening, rather than doing what Bobby mentioned Mar Mary did. She sat at Jesus' feet and listened. Of course, eager to obey the second I hear Jesus speak, but I start with a listening posture. I don't start by looking at the need in the world. I start by looking at my Jesus and listening to him speak. And I was thinking about, um, there's a verse in Ephesians 2, if you want to turn there. Ephesians 2, it says that there, Paul says there that God prepared in advance the list of things he hoped that we would do. If you look at Ephesians 2 verse 10, it says, We are God's workmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we, so that we would walk in them. And I was thinking, I've, you know, many times I've thought in my life that, you know, if, if the Lord has a set of things that he wants me to do, I want to be sure that I do them all. But as I've, as I've learned to be wise against this deception of Satan that do all the good you can is not necessarily gospel truth, what this has also showed me is, I, I've thought many times, when I, not that we have, not that there's going to be inventory or something like that, but to use a picture, if the Lord has a list of things that he determined before the foundation of the world that I would walk in, I don't, I've always thought, I don't want my list to be shorter than his list. When I get to heaven, I want to have done the things that he wants me to do. But what I'm learning also as it pertains to this deception is I, don't, I shouldn't have a list that's longer than his either. If I get to heaven, I say, here's all the things I did. And the Lord says, hey, I just actually wanted you to do these. What, what's, the, what's the difference in my list and his? That's things that's going to be burned up. First, the, First Corinthians 3 says that we build with different kinds of materials. Maybe we can look there just really quickly. First Corinthians 3, we build with different kinds of materials. And some will endure and some will not endure. First Thessalonians, or First Corinthians, sorry, um, three eleven. No man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now he's talking about now what do we build on the foundation? If any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, or straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it will it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any work which the man has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. So what I see there is there's some work which will remain, things that I do that God actually intended for me to do, and that's like, um, it, it's working with a material that won't um, be consumed by the fire. But there's also the kinds of, there's also material, he doesn't say that all the material we, we use is indestructible from fire. No, there's wood, hay, and straw there, which will, if I'm building with wood, hay, and straw, I will, uh, my work will be burnt up. And I was thinking that Satan, if he can't drag me to hell, then he, then I think his next best goal is to make sure that all of that all that I spent my life building, when the fire test my work gets burnt to the ground. If he can't drag me to hell, he'd prefer to see a bare foundation at the end of my life because I had no discernment about what did it mean to build with gold and precious stones, and I spent a lot of time building something out of wood, hay, and straw. And so I want to be wise to that deception. And I don't want to just assume that all good that I can see to be done ought to be done by me. I want to make sure that my list, so to speak, matches the Lord's. And then the, uh, the second deception that I see um, Satan using, and this is one that I've been dealing with personally in the last few weeks. I've shared with some of you privately, but I feel that because Satan knows that we are wholehearted and we want to please the Lord, we want to be utterly devoted to him, we want to be separated from the world, we want to be free from sin, I think another way that he de um, can deceive us is by distracting us with a thousand trivial convictions in our minds and in our emotions. He can give us lots of convictions that aren't actually born of the Spirit, but that make us think we need to have a long list of rules. We need to, um, and, and what it can do is it can cause us to be paranoid. We can spend our lives wondering, oh, am I doing, is this wrong? Is this wrong? Is this wrong? Is there a rule? And we, we can always be referring to a set of rules that we've constructed. And I think Satan wins if he um, gets us to see our progress in Christlikeness as an ever-growing list of um, permissible enjoyments that we've given up. If we are judging our progress as a list of things that we no longer do, 
or give up, especially permissible things. Obviously, sin, we should give up. But permissible things, if, if, I'm, if I judge my progress as all these things that I used to do but don't do, then I'm in danger. Um, I'm in danger of being deceived, of thinking that my rules are saving me, which is not true at all. Um, the challenge with this, uh, there, and there's a verse here too, um, Colossians 2, if you want to look there. It's what I would say, even before we look at Colossians 2, is the challenge with both of these deceptions, the do all the good you can deception and the, um, you know, um, racking up rules deception, they both, there's an allure to them for wholehearted Christians because you can see how the scriptures could possibly support them. We can see, right? I can see in the scriptures, you know, um, Paul says, exercise self-control in all things, Right? Um, Romans says even Jesus didn't please himself. And so I can take some of these verses and I can, I can justify my ever-expanding list of rules if I want to. But just because I can find a scripture to justify something that I'm thinking or feeling, it doesn't mean it's of God. We see that Satan even tempted Jesus with scripture. Will he not tempt us as well with scripture and give us, and, and it's so important to know in our minds, not just it is written, but as we've heard Brother Zach say, it is also written. And I think I've experienced Satan coming to me and tempting me with scriptures. And if I don't have the, it is also written, then I am uh, defenseless. And there's a verse in Colossians 2, which is a good, it is also written towards the thought that I need more and more rules and every rule must be a good one. And every pleasure must be denied and all of this. It's in um, Colossians 2 verse 20. If you've died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why is if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? Verse 23, these are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but they're of no value against fleshly indulgence. It's amazing to see that Paul says all of these rules about don't touch, don't handle, don't taste, they're of no value against fleshly indulgence. And I, re I was reading that this week and I was thinking, wow, I have to be honest, I've started to think that these rules of mine are of some value against fleshly indulgence. I've been a little deceived here. I've been a little deceived into putting stock in my list of rules. And um, I want to be careful against it. Be and, and the reason that I, I mentioned these two deceptions is both of them, the thought that I need to do all the good that I possibly can do, and the thought that every rule I can conjure up must be a good one, they both bring a lot of unnecessary condemnation. And they rob us of our joy in Jesus Christ. And they ironically cause us, they draw us out of the rest that we so long to enter. Why, as a wholehearted disciple, do I eagerly long to submit to every um, command of God? Because I know it will bring rest. So if in seeking rest, I start just submitting to a bunch of self-made religious rules, it's actually preventing me to enter into the very rest that I long for. And it's such a deception. Um, it's the other, it's the, it's, it's guarding against both sides of the cliff. We talk a lot about um, fleeing from worldliness, fleeing from the love, fleeing from the love of this world. Um, that's our emphasis here, living pure lives, living free from sin, the mastery of sin and being overcomers. But the other side of the cliff, if we're not careful, is being Pharisees and being legalists. And I think it's a great deception to think more rules is a good thing. And um, I, I personally want to be free. Um, and so, so those are the two deceptions. The two um, things that have helped me this week is I've, there's actually a lot of things, uh, a lot of things that other, of, others of you have shared, and I thank you for all of them. But two things that have just um, blessed my heart. Um, one thing is I feel, it's in Hebrews 5, um, I must grow in discernment. If I'm going to know what on the list, so to speak, is of God, and what is of my own kind of ideas about doing good in the world. And conversely, on the rule, as far as the rules for my life, what is God's word for me in that moment? And what is a rule that, I have, that I'm wrongly applying? In both cases, I must have discernment. And it's um, something that I'm longing for. And in Hebrews 5, there's, a, there's something that touched my heart. Um, it says at the end of it, it tells us how we grow in discernment. And Hebrews 5.14, it says, Solid food is the, for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Practice. So I can know that practice, doing good and resisting evil, trains my senses. 
um, so that I can discern. I can grow in discernment as I practice. And I've, I've thought about that a lot, that as I practice doing good, loving righteousness, hating iniquity, I can grow in my discernment. But I had never really thought, practice of what? What am I practicing? And this, this is what's blessed me this week, is to think, what is the practice that I need to train my senses to discern good and evil? And if I look earlier in this chapter of Hebrews 5, I see Jesus. And it says in verse 7 of Jesus, in the days of his flesh, when he was on earth, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. And what I see, what I need to practice is crying out when I don't know. When I see some good that I could do, I need to cry out. I need to not assume it's good. I see it. The need is the call, but I need to say, no, Lord, just like Jesus, I need to cry out for discernment. Say, Lord, is this on your list, so to speak? Again, I don't believe in that you know, physical artifact, but is this on your list or is this just my idea of good? You know, and, when I, and when a rule comes to my mind, I need to say, Lord, is this, is this the Holy Spirit? Or is this some idea I have about what's right and wrong? And is this the knowledge of good and evil or the tree of life? I want to eat from the tree of life and I want to flee from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what this shows me is the way that I grow in discernment between good and evil is I practice crying out. And I've been convicted, I don't cry out enough. I am so self-sufficient. I'm so self-reliant. I so judge according to what my eyes see and what my ears hear. And I it's the bar is still really high for what causes me to cry out. And for me, I've been thinking about this. I want the bar to get much lower that even things that appear simple. I want to say, Lord, I don't know. It appears simple to me, but I don't want to judge. You know, I heard a brother Zach um, was preaching last week. One thing he said is the sun he said, watching the sun go across the sky every single day is God's reminder to us. Do not trust your eyes. I love that. Because the sun going across the sky, you know what the you know what the problem is? It's not going across the sky. It's not at all. We can watch the sun go across the sky every single day. And he said that's God's way of reminding us, never trust your eyes. And um, I feel there's still, I'm deeply convicted, there's so many things that I just, my natural instinct and understanding kicks in. This seems good, I'll do it. This seems like a good rule, so I'll abstain. And I don't cry out. I don't know what the answer is, but I know that, it's, that it starts with this practice of crying out. And I have to have it. I have to do it more. Um, the other um, thing is, it can be discouraging. Seeing, like For example, um, taking this lack of discernment that I feel, there's a sense in which I was telling Michelle, I, in a real way, and I don't say this in a fake way at all, I feel farther than I've than I've ever seen before. It's like, I lack this level of, this is foundational. I said, I feel so far. And I felt that. And I've, uh, in times of prayer this week, I've, there have been times where I've been discouraged, but one thing that God keeps bringing to my heart, which has encouraged me and brought me out of that discouragement is, don't look at your lack, look at my fullness. If you're discouraged, as long as you're looking at what you lack. But when you look at me and you see all authority in heaven on earth has been given to Jesus Christ and he's interceding for you, that stirs up your heart, that stirs up courage and faith and hope. If I'm looking at what I'm lacking, then I get discouraged. Um, it says, there's a verse in um, Romans 4 that Abraham, it says that he considered his body, it was good as dead. But then, he didn't stop by considering his body, it says then, but he considered him who promised and there's a question to me, do I, 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 there are many ways in which, honestly, family, I consider myself good as dead. As it pertains to these matters of spiritual discernment and growing in wisdom, I'm as good as dead. But do I stop at just making that assessment and seeing I'm as good as dead? Or do I then look at the promise of God who says, faithful is he who calls you, he will also bring it to pass. He is able to make you stand blameless in the presence of God, body, soul, and spirit. Am I looking at that promise and is it stirring up hope or am I looking at how far I have to go? You know, there's a Psalm, um, I close with this, Psalm 42. I was reminded of this the other night praying with, with some of the students. Psalm 42 verse 5, he says, Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God. I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. What I see here is the reason my soul is in despair is because I stopped hoping in God. And the answer, if I find when I see this lack, which I do in myself, 
if it causes me to despair, it's because I forget the one who's promised is so faithful and he's so powerful and he's so loving. And anytime I find myself being in despair, I need to do what the psalmist says here. Hope in God. He says it again in Psalm 43 in verse 5. Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Hope in God. Stop looking at your lack and start looking at my fullness. And my honest experience has been as I look at God's fullness, it brings me the re uh, the rest and the joy and the excitement that I need, the confidence that he'll bring me in. Every time I'm reminded of my lack, I'm discouraged until I look at him and his promise. And so for me, I want to, um, I want to cry out more in these areas of discernment and these areas of deception. I want to cry out more to the Lord and I want to look at God and what he's promised and not always be thinking about um, how much I'm still lacking.